Good morning. Welcome to the K webinar for Wednesday, 1st of March. And today we're looking at proposed construction projects, competence standard with Hannah Clark. As part of the work of the competence steering group, CPA has published a white paper with proposals of a construction products competence standard that will impact how the entire built environment identifies and demonstrates construction um, products competence. Hannah will be talking about the standard described within the white paper, why this standard is necessary, and how the standard will be used. Um, my name is Shanika, and I am the training le and learning administrator here at CABE, and I'll be acting as a um, moderator for this morning's session. Um, we like to make our webinars interactive, so we do encourage you throughout the session to send in any questions as we go along, which we will address with a Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you are watching us live, you can use the side panel to send in any questions. Alternatively, you can get in touch with us via the social links now on screen. Let me introduce today's webinar speaker, Hannah Clark, Digital and Policy Manager at Construction Products Association. CPA are the leading organisation representing construction product manufacturers and suppliers. She works closely with the DLUHC, the new building safety regulator, and the new national regulator for construction products. She represents CPA at the Competence Steering Group and is chair of the CSG Strategy Group and co-chair of their working group 12 Construction Products Competence, of which produced the report Built Environment. So if you give me a couple of seconds, I will just hand over to Hannah and she will begin shortly. Um, Hannah, would you like to share your screen? Yeah, lovely. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to bring up my slides now. Uh, uh, there we go. Can you see that all right? Yes. Wonderful. Fantastic. Well, it's lovely to be here. Wonderful to be invited here. Um, just to give you a bit more of a background on um, the CPA. We represent over 85% of manufacturers and distributors of construction products in the UK. And over 78% of all the construction products used in the UK are made here in the UK. So we really do represent a quite vibrant part of the UK economy. So back when we started this project, we really wanted to identify what a problem, what the problem was that we were looking to tackle. And um, it is clear that every profession and occupation across the built environment uses or otherwise works with construction products. And we know that the misuse of construction products can negatively impact the performance of systems. In the smallest instance, that means something's not going to perform quite right. Uh, but in the worst case scenarios, we've got very dangerous or even potentially fatal consequences. So currently, there is no consistent way of recognising who is or who is not competent to use or work with construction products uh, uniformly up the supply chain. Now, given that construction products are the linchpin of the built environment, that seems to be a big problem um, that we cannot easily communicate up the supply chain what construction product competence looks like. So why do we need to think about this? Now, I know that I'm addressing some people here in the UK, and I'm also uh, addressing some potentially people further afield. And um, to those further afield, this is very appropriate, but I do apologize because I will be speaking to some UK legislation that's coming down the line. But I still think that a lot of the stuff that we've got in here is totally transferable, totally applicable. Obviously, building safety and built environment safety has to be our number one thought in this. We have to ensure that when we're using construction products that they go in the right place at the right time and they're chosen by the competent person to make sure that the, the systems that we are creating are appropriate. So the number one reason we should be doing this is to make sure that those who are using the uh, uh, systems, the built environments, the buildings that we're creating, that they are safe. We also have uh, net zero requirements. This is right across the board. And we cannot achieve these unless we really 100% understand how we're using our construction products. Also, we have a real challenge that we are looking to digitalize our information, uh, that we need to be able to have a far more efficient uh, supply chain with information going 
write up the piece. We can't do that once again, unless we know precisely what kind of construction product information we're passing on. And we're competent about the uh, exchanges. Now, for those in England, we know that there's a Building Safety Act coming along. The, the, this is a very pivotal um, act. I'm going to speak about it uh, a bit more in a second. Uh, and as part of that, we are going to have a new building safety regulator. And that's going to bring very, very different changes when it comes to oversight. And you can better believe that the insurers are paying very strong attention to this. In fact, I was just sitting in a meeting last week where there were several insurers in the room and they were saying we are paying particular particular um, attention to the Building Safety Act and competence. Um, now, given that these insurers are working right across the globe as well, if they're going to start paying attention to the competence more in the UK, I can only assume that they're going to be doing that outside of further afield as well. This is a very much a global situation we're dealing with here. And of course, with a new um, uh, requirements within legislation, we have requirements of duty right across the supply chain. So we're going to see a supply chain that if we're not appropriately able to identify the competence of um, those using construction products, you're not going to be able to uh, uh, work within the supply chain. So it's very important uh, that we all come together when we're thinking about this. So now just I'm going to spend a few slides talking about the Building Safety Act. Um, and, and why this is gonna have such a pivotal impact on, on the entire um, built environment industry. So the built Envi Building Safety Act is an enormous bill. I, I mean, it's the largest piece of legislation we've seen um, that is directed towards uh, our industry in, in over 50 years. It's 171 clauses uh, long. And I think a lot of people have a, a misconception about the Building Safety Act that it is to it is going to be specifically for buildings in scope. So that's buildings which are over 18 meters high uh, that are occupied. And and that is just simply not the case. Yes, there is going to be part four, which is about a, a, an enhanced regime for high risk buildings. But the majority of the Building Safety Impact, uh, Building Safety Act will have um, application to everybody who's working in buildings. And particularly, this is about bringing in oversight. So we've got two new regulators coming in. We've got the Building Safety Regulator, the BSR, which sits under the HSC. And we've also got a new regulator for construction products. And with that oversight, it's what we're going to see is a far stronger sense of um, and the necessity for accountability. The Building Safety Regulator has three main functions. It's to lead the delivery of a new, more stringent regulatory regime for buildings in scope. And it's also to promote competence for all buildings and oversight for the safety of all buildings. And it's very clear this is going to have an impact in all buildings. And, and I would go so far as if they're looking at the competence for all of those working in all buildings, lots of that work is going to extend to the rest of the built environment as well, because you cannot make changes in a silo. Uh, this is going to have to be a sea change. So that means it's gonna affect the culture of everybody uh, working in the built environment. Now, we don't know what the particular statutory instruments of, of, of competence looks like yet, because it has yet to be published, but we have had sight of the draft competence regulations. They're no longer available on the DCLG, um, uh, DCLG, my God, that's going back years, DLUC website, um, but we have seen it, um, seen an early draft. Now, what we can take from this is that 100% it is going to be applicable to all buildings, not just buildings in scope. Within that, there's some clear themes. So duty holders must demonstrate a competent workforce. So that means that they must demonstrate the competence of the those within their employ and the supply chain within their employ. So that's the clients, the principal contractor, the principal designer, and those who are looking after building safe, uh, the management of, of um, buildings. 
we know that skills is defined, uh, um, competence is defined as skills, knowledge, experience, and behavior. Now that's very key. Skills, knowledge, experience, we're very used to being able to identify what a standard looks like for those behavior, not so much. But the, the, the key things within the regulations that we need to point out is that companies must be able to identify the competence of their individuals, and they must be able to demonstrate that the individuals within their um, companies are and, and, and those in their workforce, so their supply chain as well, they must be able to identify that those individuals are not working outside their competence. So they must refuse to carry out any building work which is not in compliance with any relevant requirement. That's talking about the competences, working outside of your competences. Now, the Building Safety Act, um, that reached royal assent in April 2022. And implementation is identified to move from May 2022 to May 2024. I don't know about any of you, but that really, really worries me because as far as the health and safety executive is concerned, they are working on the basis that the built environment can already demonstrate competence. We're already doing the work, they say, therefore we can already demonstrate competence. So I think we've got a real challenge within us to make sure that we've got the training infrastructure in place, that we've got, we can actually identify all of the individuals who are having impacts on the creation of buildings. And we can be able to assure them that they are working only to the ceiling of the competent, their competence. The Building Safety Act now include, has made it uh, clear that there are penalties involved. Not There's no longer a slap on, on the wrist. You can, if you're going against uh, the re regulations, you can receive unlimited fines and prison time. Something interesting within this, I think, is the CDM, uh, the new regulations reflect the CDM regs. So that includes the definition of a designer. So that means that a designer will, will extend to anybody who uh, makes a choice around construction products. If you're making a decision around construction products, you are automatically designer. So that means that you have design responsibility and design liability. There is a duty of competence on the entire supply chain. So that is very key. It's not just going to be certain individuals. The entire supply chain must be able to demonstrate their competence. Because this is all such an enormous challenge, and, and we recognise straight away from the Hackett report being published back in, um, in uh, 2018, the Competence Steering Group was founded. So the Competence Steering Group is essentially um, a, an amalgamation of many bodies uh, from right across the UK um, and they span the entire built environment and initially we've identified 12 working groups um, which identify areas that uh, needed competence review and what I'm going to be talking to you today is about working group 12, the, the, the working group I chair and construction product competence. The aim of our group was to create a solution that ensures that all of those interacting with construction products are competent to do so and can demonstrate their competence to others. I, I put a, a definition of construction products down there for anybody who's really keen. That is actually taken from uh, the standard BS8670 and also it is the CPA definition of a construction product. But yeah, the aim is to make sure that anybody interacting with construction products is competent to do so, but key is that they can demonstrate their competence to others. Now we have a bunch of standards that have emerged in the last few years. Most of them have been um, put together through the competence steering group and in fact the very first one I'm going to point to was uh, was authored by Cave's own uh, Richard Harrell. Uh, so we've got here built environment core criteria for building safety in competence frameworks code of practice. Now this is a very key standard. What is this looking at? This is what we would consider a framework for frameworks. If anybody was thinking right across the built environment, 
we're going to set up some training and and uh or we're going to set up a qualification or we're going to create you, you know a framework of competence for us you have to check this one because what this is is essentially a glorified checklist you have to go through it and identify if any of this is applicable to the functions or roles that you're putting the qualifications or training for and check is this appropriate yes then we've got to include it if this is not appropriate don't worry about that move that to one side you it's there to make sure that everybody is working from a level playing field when we're thinking about competence frameworks now that is currently being redeveloped into a, a British standard, a full British standard. And then also part of the, um, the picture, we've got uh, PAS 8671, which is the uh, competence for principal designers, 8672, which is competence of principal contractors, uh, PAS 8673, which is competence for those who are managing safety in residential buildings. What all of these have in common and so they say that you must be competent with construction products, but they do not say how. What they also all say is that you must be able to identify the competence of your workforce or the capacity of your workforce, but they do not tell you how. So I think this is a really good space for us to bring in a standard about construction product competence because it has an application to everybody across the built environment. So if you could get everybody competent with construction products, you would be a very, very, uh, you might not be all of the way, but you'd be pretty far in identifying the competence of your workforce. So what does this white paper cover that we have um, published? It, it, the white paper is available on the CPA website. I'm sure we'll be able to share a link as well for any of those of you who haven't been able to see it, but I'll give you an overview of what it's covering. First, it's, it's covering proposals for an industry agreed standard. And that covers core level criteria that should be achieved, demonstrated and maintained by all individuals making choices concerning construction products. It also has proposals for a methodology to define how those core level criteria can be applied by industry across the sector and how industries and organizations can use these principles to demonstrate their workforce has met the appropriate competences for their duties, uh, accountabilities and responsibilities. We've broken this whole process down into uh, six steps because if we put together a standard, that is clearly not it. You know, we can't just put out a standard there and assume, okay, now, now we're all fixed. So we've got this in five, uh, six steps. The first step is to put out a um, industry agreed standard. The second is that uh, industries, ex they commit to the CPC principles because you, you will need all of the built environment industry to make a commitment to work in this way um, and to do the work. The standard is only going, is similar to 8670, it's going to be more of a framework for people to kind of, um, uh, map themselves against. So the step three will be for industries to agree how to demonstrate construction product competence. That's mapping their training and qualifications against the standard, and there will be have to be some gap analysis there. And step four is about demonstrating construction product competence. Uh, step five is about utilizing construction product competence. And then of course, the whole system does have to go under periodic review. So I'm going to be talking majority about step one. Step one is to create an industry agreed standard. So we have the 8670 series, um, and the idea is that this be included into the 8670 series. Uh, and 8670 part two, should you will, because it has application in an overarching capacity. And um, currently where we are with that is that um, CPB1, the committee in BSI that deals with uh, built environment competence, have um, recommended that this proposal be put forward as a British standard. Uh, it's gone through proposal stage and now we're just in the last stages of um, having the business case agreed with uh, BSI. So we're in a good place, not 100% there yet, but we are in a good place to getting 
uh, that piece of work done. But I, I, I feel very confident by, by one manner or the other, we're going to get a standard um, which is, it will be agreed through BSI uh, through the consensus processes. What, who is this precisely aimed at? So the CPC core level criteria, I do apologise to anybody who has missed what CPC stands for, because it, whenever you're talking competence, there's so many things in built environments, it becomes acronym city um, or initialism in this case. But uh, CPC stands for construction product competence, just to be very clear. Construction product competence is such a thing to be saying every five seconds. So CPC. It's, a, it's a, applicable to those who are designing, marketing or selling construction products, providing technical support for construction products, specifying construction products or designing with construction products, procuring construction products, handling or installing construction products, supervising, inspecting or verifying other functions around construction products, exchanging information about construction products, owning, maintaining, or decommissioning construction products. So I, I, you can see here, this is not really a, a, a standard that's just aimed at manufacturers. This is very much aimed at everybody right across the piece. Uh, there will be more uh, functions that would deal with construction products, of course, um, but you know, you can't include everything. It's not an exhaustive list is what I'm going to say. And um, just to be clear, I'm talking about functions and not roles. Um, what do I mean by functions as opposed to roles? Because it would be easier to say roles. I think everybody agrees they know what a role is. But the reality is, is that a role isn't actually a very good descriptor for what you do. Um, you know, if you said somebody was a project manager, does that really clearly define what it is they're doing? It, it doesn't. So just as an example, I've got a manufacturer, an engineer, a contractor here. Each one of them might be doing the task of um, specifying. So we can put a competence against the, the, um, the function of specifying far easier than we can to a role. So I will be talking about the competence of functions and this is how it can be made applicable. So what are the core construction product competence core level criteria? They're a set of applicable principles, essentially, and they're here to give clear levels of product competence that are applicable. They're really a tool for um, the industry to be able to demonstrate uh, different levels of competence right across the industry. But the important thing about it is to make sure that it's clear where an actor has the appropriate competence to carry out functions and where they do not. Clarity around where they do not have the competence is actually a very positive thing for the person doing the task, as well as the people around them, to, to be able to hold your hands up and say, no, that's the limit of my competence. It's just safer if we pass it along here. Knowing the feeling of the competence, I think, is going to be integral in this picture. We have divided up the different levels according to levels of responsibility and accountability. So at the very lowest level, we have level E, and this is still a level of competence, it's appropriate competence, but it's, it's for those responsible for performing tasks with and about construction products under supervision and responsible for relaying information about construction products without interpretation. So this is a level where you do not make decisions. There are no decisions to be made here. You are able to do tasks when you are being told precisely what to do and relay information when you're getting that from an authoritative source. So E is really about opening up the, somebody's mind to the world of construction products. D is a step further. C is a step further again. So at level C is the point where you can start making decisions. At this point, you can be responsible for developing product information for construction products within a direct scope of application. What do I mean by a direct scope of application? A direct scope of application is when a manufacturer says a construction product can do this. 
if a manufacturer tells you the intended use, then somebody at level C can design with it. If it's working outside of what the manufacturer uh, declares as an intended use, that would become an extended scope of application. We've taken some similar language to that of um, the world of testing, which is direct uh, field of application and, and extended field of application. It's very similar concepts, but it's just brought a step forward to what the manufacturer has declared the product should be able to do. So by level B, you can be accountable for um, the accuracy of in, uh, product information with about direct scopes of application. And you can be responsible for developing product information uh, within extended scopes or uh, bespoke, uh, extended scopes of application or for bespoke products. And then at level A, a is really the buck stops here. This is a, the highest level of accountability, accountable for all the product decisions, assessment, selection, change, recommendations, approval, and also accountable for the organization's um, uh, rules. So for example, rules relating to design, substitution, product information, for example. I think this particular um, scale would potentially have quite an impact on how uh, people perform their work because I'm not convinced that always the highest point of sign up of when it comes to construction products comes with somebody with the highest level of competence. So and this may have an impact uh, that's worth thinking about. What do the construction pro uh, product competence core levels cover? At every single level, we have uh, nine different topics, which are always, um, we always have requirements within them. So the, the nine topics are responsibility and accountability. I would say that this is the most important intrinsic uh, uh, set of competences. This is the set of competences that says within your level of competence, you can do this, you cannot do this. No, no, no. So that's the important one. Well, I mean, they're all important, but that's really key. Uh, the second um, the second group is construction product performance and characteristics. Uh, third one is regulation standards and certification. Four is products as part of a built environment system, including uh, substitution value engineering. So that's making sure that we are thinking about dependencies uh, when we're selecting construction products. Uh, five is insulation information. Six is durability, life and maintenance. Seven is warranties and guarantees. Eight is storage and handling. And nine is competence maintenance. So there are requirements in those, in those nine topics at every single level. So say we've got this beautiful standard, Magic Land, we've, we've done it. The, the step two, I, I, I mean, this step two can come sooner. I'd love for the whole industry to do this right now. We've got the white paper out. I think we've all got the premise. So step two is about committing to the CPC principles. So that would allow organizations to establish basic rules in which they can control the application of CPC. Uh, and I think it's worth noting, as I said before, that the core level criteria, that that will have an impact on processes, particularly around responsibility, accountability and communication. So once you've made that acceptance, that commitment, then it's on to step three, mapping methods of demonstration. Similarly to how 8670 is set out, um, this, this CPC standard is there to um, cover an enormous amount of industry. It's there to try and be applicable to so many different occupations and, and um, professions. As such, there is absolutely no way that within one set of um, uh, level that every single requirement is going to be applicable to one person. I, I would be very shocked if somebody could ever retain that much competence. So the, it's the idea is to have a holistic picture and then the industry will go in and they will identify what is appropriate um, to their functions. So they can do essentially identification of what's appropriate to their functions and then map how it will be demonstrated. As part of this process, what we do anticipate is a, a certain amount of gap analysis would be need to be had. Um, we would expect, particularly in some of the uh, industries that don't 
um, historically have a strong presence with construction product competence, for example, maybe procurements, um, that we would see that there aren't necessarily methods of demonstration that are easily accessible, and so there would have to be some work to remedy that. Uh, we think that this process can be done in two ways. We think it could be done by individual companies, or we think it also can be done um, by uh, from an industry consensus perspective. So, for example, someone like Cave, for example, might want to identify functions within their professions and um, set up working groups to identify uh, what competences would look like and what methods of demonstration would look like. Um, but it may be that uh, organisations just want to do that piece of work for themselves. There are pros and cons for each of those approaches uh, which are identified within the white paper. The aim is to create what we're calling CPC profiles. So that's what I was saying, that uh, mapping of um, which particular functions require which um, requirements and how to demonstrate it. So we have identified uh, two examples of a CPC profile within the report. We've got, um, and I apologise, the, the writing is so small, but you just can't fit this stuff on a, a slide. It's not always the best. We we identified um, a uh, warehouse, uh, somebody doing the function of warehouse operating, um, and they were doing that for the products of architectural ironmongery. And we also did that for um, somebody who would be specifying architectural ironmongery or, or scheduling architectural ironmongery, as it's really known. Um, so just the same product, it's different functions within those products. And you can see here, what I can't include in this is that there is also a list of the appropriate um, requirements that have been identified within um, H6, uh, uh, within the CPC standard, also with behavioural requirements that have been identified within BS8670. And that has been itemised. And the Guild of Architectural Ironmongery, this is, is uh, draft in only, but they've identified that if you're going to do specifying architectural ironmongery to meet those requirements, you would need a combination of training, experience, qualifications, CPD at a much higher level for, um, for specifying architectural ironmongery as one would expect them, for example, warehouse operating. But it would be a combination of methods of de demonstration to get you to that point. Um, some of these, for example, within the specifying architectural ironmongery are considered optional, for example, the foundation in, in the hardware, and some of them they would consider mandatory. I mean, it is only one route to competence. There may well be very um, other alternative ones, but it's you can see how if a, a trade association such as Guild of Architecture Ironmongery declares what, what competence looks like for different functions, how that would give a sense of confidence to the rest of the industry that these people are really um, holistically competent in what they do. So then once we've got uh, the uh, methods of demonstration identified, then we can work for individuals to achieve their uh, demonstration and for, for uh, organisations to ensure the individuals within their employ uh, don't work outside the scope of that competence. So verification can be self-assessed by organisations, but the method of demonstration can be interrogated by, for example, employers, clients, regulators, uh, so on and so forth. But then we've got a clear way to be able to say this person is at competence level C, for example, and you'd be able to communicate clearly the competence of the workforce in a transparent way up the supply chain. And then finally, we've got utilisation. So we can have clients requiring that their supply chain should uh, demonstrate construction product competence, uh, reference it within their contracts. Uh, we could uh, make sure that th their duty holders can use that to demonstrate the competence of their workforce, contractors. Uh, they, they may uh, use it to qualify the competence of their supply chain before they enter a decision about uh, bringing them on board. Um, manufacturers, we have a code for construction product information, and part of that accreditation requires that you be able to identify the competence of your workforce, so they can use this as a method to do that. Insurers may use it to assess the risk of an organisation. Of course, risk 
regulators can use it to assure that uh, the duty holders have uh, appropriately demonstrated the competence of their workforce. And of course, I mean, it's a standard, everything needs improving. So the whole thing would go under review. We would want periodic review of the standard. We would want um, industries to be periodically reviewing uh, that their functions have been appropriately identified and that the competence is appropriate. Periodic review of the actual individuals of demonstrating construction product competence. Maintenance is key. You can't just be competent once and then assume that will last a lifetime. So uh, essentially, when we come to the end of this, uh, what do we want from you? Oh, I really want everybody to see how important this work is. Um, and, and it's vitally urgent that we get on board, really. Uh, legislation is coming down the line. And for those of you who legislation isn't appropriate to, this is really about having a supply chain that can really communicate to each other, that can be really clear and that you can work effectively and efficiently both uh, inside your own company and externally and I think we're going to have a safer and much more productive um, uh, construction built environment industry uh, if we go in this direction. So I, I urge you to read the white paper, share it, discuss it, trial it, test it. What isn't working and what's not? We are going to go through a development uh, stage with the standards. It will open for public consultation. I want people as ready as possible to be able to uh, respond to that public consultation. I want us to have had as much input as possible and uh, a scenario where, you know, constructive feedback is key to making sure that this all works. And just to let you also know, the Construction Products Association has a peer support group for people who are um, starting to do the work of responding to the white paper and trying to implement some of these ideas within their own company. The CPA peer support group is not limited to manufacturers and distributors, and it's not limited to CPA members. If anybody wants to start doing this work and wants to come into a space where other people are doing that work and to bounce ideas off each other, by all means, give me Give me an email. Um, I'm much. I'm very happy to try and bring as many people on this journey as possible. And it's a lot. I cannot. I can identify that. You know, we're 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 requesting that the industry do an awful lot. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, there's my email address. Uh, w the uh, Construction Products Association email is down there in tiny little letters. Do go there. See the white paper. Give it a read. I will stop sharing now and uh, open up for questions. Thank you, Hannah. That was very interesting. Um, now this is the opportunity for any questions if you'd like to send those in. But I would like to thank Hannah and everyone who's joined this morning. Just to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel uh, soon. Um, if there is anyone that has viewed today's session and think it will benefit a colleague, please do share the link. Um, okay, so we don't have any questions at the moment. No questions. My word, oh, that would wow. be an utter first. Should we leave it 30 seconds just to see if somebody can type quick enough? Ah, um, we've had a comment from Sandra. No questions, but very informative. Or maybe my work is done. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Most unexpected. Oh, I've got one question. Okay. How will this link to withdrawal of BS 476 and UKCA? Well, BS 476, I mean, I mean, it will link in so far that to be competent uh, with construction products, you would have to be aware about the potential withdrawal of BS 476. Um, and, and I mean, the, the standard isn't specific. The proposed standard isn't specific about um, all of the different standards which are available out there. It does say that you need to have certain levels of competence and, and understanding within those st standards to be able to, to, um, to do your work appropriately. Now, I would hope that anybody who's using construction products to a certain level would understand the importance of BS 476 uh, as it currently stands within the regulations, and if that is withdrawn, what impact that will potentially have. It's a, it's a vital thing to be able to know. Uh, similarly, 
with the UK CA mark. I mean that. I mean that is opening up its own bottle of worms, uh, can of worms, if you if you will. Uh, that that is a scenario where currently uh, we have a very interesting thing, both for those who are providing um, construction products and using construction products, to be aware that the transition phase is, is, is causing all, so, all, all sorts of um, problems and a lot of lack of clarity. Manufacturers don't know what the end point looks like. And we've got a big question because currently if, if, if the UK CA mark um, uh, challenges aren't resolved and we move over to just UK CA without uh, a, an appropriate structure of testing available to us and we don't have the ability to have um, uh, recognition of the testing houses within in um, in the EU uh, then we're going to be very challenged I think to make sure that we're keeping up with the amount of testing that you have to do to ensure that con uh, construction products are safe uh, I would suggest that, that that you know the CPC standard is there to try and be an overview to make sure that to do your work, you have to keep your eye on some of these things. It wouldn't tell you what those things are in so much stuff, because otherwise, as as, as one, one situation changes to another, uh, <laughs> you'd have to change the standard every five seconds, but particularly in this current climate. So um, so that I, it, it says that you you have it says at different levels you have to have different levels of engagements with the standards and regulations to make sure that you can make appropriate decisions that's how it relates yes great thank you um the next one is will the standard tackle the manufacturer's information on the materials to give clearer idea on how the material is used and what it will be used for this standard will not but i tell you why it won't and um and what will so uh we did two projects at um the CPA, we did uh, one which was about construction product competence and one which was about construction product information. Uh, and we considered those to be the yin and the yang of this whole picture. You can't make a competent decision about construction products without competence information. And you can't make com competence information without competence. So, you know, the two go hand in hand. So that is why um, we set up the Marketing Integrity Group and the Marketing Integrity Group with a lot of consultation with industry uh, put together the code for construction product information. We've since handed that off um, and it's set up as a separate company with independent verification. So the code for construction product information is for manufacturers to sign up to and it independently verifies their um their uh construction product information to make sure that they're not making claims without being able to back it up very important to make sure that their language is clear that the processes are really clear to make sure that the sign off is appropriate and it's also you can't just get verified as a company you have to do it per product group so you have to be able to identify that it's working with these sets of products and these sets of products and these sets of products quite rigorous the verification so no this will not deal with um uh product information but it works in tandem with a project that does and that will be um ccpi code for construction product information love to have your support for that uh, do do have a look for it and 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 uh uh, uh, lend your support into saying that this is something we want. Um, the more manufacturers feel that they have to do that to stay as part of the marketplace, the more sign up we'll see. Great. Okay. Um, how will this be delivered down to site operative level? Well, I mean, I, I think uh, a number of different ways. This, this is one of those scenarios where you're going to only see this pushed through if enough of the industry signs up and says this is something we want. Um, on one side, we've got um, the competence steering group actually in itself is quite a force because we represent um, so many different areas. Now there is a working group installers. We've been working quite close with them. Um, and they're looking to deliver competences for installers. And as part of that, they're looking into the competences um, that have been outlined about construction products as part of that picture. Um, it's still very much an iterative step, um, but, but you can imagine that um, it's going to be a challenge. It is genuinely going to be a challenge for us to be able to spread this word both wide and deep um, for us, 
one of the areas of concern is that we have lots of small and medium companies that may not have the um, resources to be able to do the work to identify the competences easily within their um, companies, which is why I think trade associations and um, and uh, other groups, uh, 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 chartered institutions as well, are so important to help do that work to identify what demonstration looks like so that SMEs can just say, oh, OK, we don't have to do the work of mapping. We can just see for this, we need to do this. And then they just bring up the competence of their workforce. So that's why we wanted to show that you could do this work internally through through a company. And I expect big companies will find that easiest. But also that we could do it in a way that uh, trade associations, that chartered bodies, that any any recognised group of um, through consensus could identify what competence looked like and demonstration looked like for their functions. Okay, uh, last question. Will this extend to ongoing testing kit mark versus point in time? On testing kite mark, I mean, kite mark is, 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 I must I must admit, um, I don't know what point in time is uh, and kite mark um, that would apply to so, only some um, some products that have elected to be in that picture. I think as part of this, what you would want to know is what are these very various different verifications? What are they describing? Uh, what kind of level of um, comfort can that give me as a, a user of that and, and I would suggest that there are certain methods of verification that do a different task in levels of comfort and um, can give a different variation of um, of safety you know they're, they're all doing slightly different things to be able to I identify an, a construction product and, and use it appropriately you need to know what those mechanisms look like really you need to know which ones are going to be have the most variation in what they're doing and which are the most kind of stringent as it were so i don't i'm i'm not going to lie to you i don't have the competence to identify with kite mark and and so on uh what they're bringing to the party uh but uh but then i don't actually make that many decisions about where construction products go so that's all right <laughs> but it's really about how important is that to the process to make sure that we are getting the absolutely appropriate um, products in the right place to do our jobs? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Hannah. Um, would you be able to send me a copy of your presentation slides? Sorry. Would love to. Oh. Would love to. That's yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, if you've got any feedback on webinars or any sessions you would like to see us cover, any uh, specific topics, regulations, or any industry related that you think would be a, make a good webinar, um, please get in touch. Alternatively, if you think uh, that you yourself can present our webinars again, please let us know. we will love to have you on board. Um, with that, I'll wrap up. And thank you again, uh, Hannah, for your time. And hopefully we'll see you all next month. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.